When I was a little girl, about five years old, uh, most neighborhoods had a corner grocery store. Ours was Riley's, just a couple doors down. It was a warm summer day, and I thought an ice cream cone would be good. Well, I knew how shopping worked. Mom would go to Riley's and get her groceries, and Mr. Riley would put them in a bag, and we'd leave. Mom also had a running account with Riley's that she'd pay off at the end of the week, but I didn't know that, of course. Well, I went to Riley's to get my ice cream cone. As he was getting it ready, Mr. Riley said, does your mom know about this? And I said, sure, because, I mean, what could be wrong? She did that all the time. Uh, So I took my ice cream cone and I left. So I was sitting on our lawn on a nice summer day enjoying my ice cream cone when mom happened to come to the front window. And she said, Judy, where did you get that ice cream cone? And I said, Riley's. And she said, how did you pay for it? And I said, pay? That was my first brutal lesson in economics. Well, in those days, Riley's was a wonderland for me. In particular, there was a candy counter which all the kids loved and would stare at longingly at all of the goodies inside. But there was one item on the counter that was different somehow, somehow ominous that I didn't understand at the time. There was a little black licorice figure that was called, and here I will use the word just once and then I will not use it again, a nigger baby. People used that word casually at that time Uh, like any other word. They didn't think about it as we would use any other word, but the associations with the word were always negative. Also, when the word black was used, it was always negative. Black people really appeared in the Saturday afternoon uh, matinees that we went to, uh, but when they did, it was almost always in subservient roles as maids or butlers serving white people. But there were no positive role models. Certainly, this affected our attitudes towards black people, in part because it wasn't at a conscious level. And the school history classes, which might have corrected the image, didn't help. Uh, The schools certainly mentioned slavery, that it was bad, but there was nothing that conveyed the massive trauma that was brought down upon those enslaved men, women, and children. Like most of us, I wasn't aware of the negative impressions I was accumulating in the back of my mind from childhood on, but they were there for me and for everyone else in my world. I grew up in the Lakeshore area near farm country, and I saw no people of color until I went to college. So I grew up in total ignorance of the wider world around me. My home area was modest but nice, and growing up there offered many advantages, including among other things, a good, solid education. I got to go to college because of a generous scholarship from a business in town. We had lived in considerable poverty, so that was very helpful. The kind of poverty that involves living in a recently evacuated chicken coop, uh, with, uh, but a decent size, with obviously no running water anywhere in the home. And of course, we enjoyed the well-known amenities of an outhouse. So yes, we were very poor, but things changed and allowed us to move to a much better upstairs flat in Two Rivers. The fact that we could move into a better environment with help from grandparents was an advantage not available to everyone. But more importantly, speaking of advantages, I was white. And in this country, as we know, being white provides you with significant advantage. Our lives began to improve. Mom was able to get a job in a factory just a block from our house. I loved my neighborhood school, and it provided the education that I needed. And in part because I was white, I was always praised for my good work and given access to more opportunities that further rewarded me, leading to the big scholarship to college. Yes, I worked, and I worked hard for that scholarship. But what I didn't know at the time and didn't find out until later, was that many other bright kids, and very bright kids, never got that chance because they were the wrong color. Where was the sense in that? But the question was not in my mind as I entered college a few years later, going to the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee. My first college class was logic, which terrified me because I knew nothing about it. Our professor walked into the room at 8 o'clock that Monday morning. He was tall 
darker than anyone else in the room, and had a uh, had curly hair and an easy smile. His name was Dr. Cornelius L. Golightly. I will never forget him. I didn't know it then, but his parents had been born to previously enslaved people. He did very well in school. He got his bachelor's degree, then went on to earn his doctorate in philosophy, and finally did postdoctoral work at Harvard as well. He held numerous prestigious academic positions, as well as one with the US government. In addition, he was always committed to the advancement of racial justice and worked on that throughout his life. There's far too much to tell about this remarkable man, but we were very fortunate that he came to UW-Milwaukee. Well, he may not have considered this one of his great accomplishments, but I did. He succeeded in teaching me logic, and I passed the class with a better than average grade. After the passage of a few years, I married, and I, my then husband and I both went to school at Stevens Point to finish our degrees. There we were considered non-traditional students to finish, to, uh, uh, and because we were married and a little bit older than most of the other students. This put us in contact with other non-trad students, including six guys that we met who were black students, and they were from Kenya in Africa. They'd come to this country to get an education, and since we were all in the non-trad group, we rapidly became close friends. They were very smart, very knowledgeable, and we en and enjoyed talking as much as we did, along with a certain amount of partying. As my world kept expanding, I came to be more and more troubled with what I was learning about racial discrimination. I could certainly understand not liking individuals. There were several I wasn't crazy about, but it wasn't logical to take an entire group and not like or even to hate them because of some accident of birth. It wasn't logical. It wasn't fair. Maybe something from Professor Golightly's class had taken root. After Stevens Point, there were other significant stops along the way, including my service for four years as national president <clears throat> as at the, of the National Organization for Women. But even during that time, we included a focus on discrimination on the basis of color because black women suffered double discrimination, both as women and because they were black. Over these years, I learned more and more about the realities of the lives of black people, and I studied and read widely on my own. I knew, of course, something about slavery, but actually very little. And I learned more about the Reconstruction period, the chilling realities of the Jim Crow period, and the beginning of legalized segregation, which was embedded in the practice of redlining neighborhoods, whereby realtors divided up cities into sections of neighborhoods and uh, with black areas indicated in red as undesirable. Clearly, redlining locked in segregation. There's a fascinating example of this practice that occurred in the 1940s in a suburb of Detroit. A real estate developer in the area wanted to build a new development. So they applied for a loan to the FHA, Federal Housing Authority, yes, our government. But they were refused for the loan unless they built a wall between the proposed development and a nearby black neighborhood. And they did. They built a wall. It was a half mile long, six feet high, and four inches wide. Uh, today, the wall is still there. Today, it's covered with colorful murals and the people in the neighborhood call it the segregation wall. The newest manifestation of discrimination is what is referred to as mass incarceration. In short, this results from the fact that we have, in effect, criminalized blackness. Consequently, more black people are being arrested, convicted, and imprisoned out of all proportion to their actual numbers in the population. According to the US Bureau of Justice Statistics, the incarceration rate of black males is more than six times as high as for white males. So we equate blackness with criminality. Because of that, we often fear black people or are uncomfortable around them. Our attention is brought to black or darker people because they tend to stand out in a white community. And the high visibility of black men has certainly added to the unfounded and unfair stereotypes about them that persist. 
Uh, the, that brings us to the current realities that have occupied so much of the news in recent times, the killing of black men by police officers. One such incident occurred on April 19th in 2015, and it changed my life. That was the day Freddie Gray died. He was a black man who lived in Baltimore. He was walking along the street when he was stopped by some police officers for no apparent reason, although they later alleged that he had a small knife on him. They dragged him to the police van. There was a video of this. With his head hanging down, his arms hanging loosely, and his feet dragging along the ground. They tossed him into the police van, handcuffed, handcuffed behind his back, and shut the door, and then gave him what the Baltimore police called a rough ride. He had no way to anchor himself inside the van as it sped through the streets of Baltimore, taking the corners at high speed. When they arrived at the police station, he was unresponsive. They took him to the hospital at, where he was pronounced dead of spinal fractures and a broken neck. The black community in Baltimore was shocked and outraged, of course. They demonstrated and burned some buildings. Here in Fond du Lac, I heard a few people who were discussing the incident saying such things as, well, slavery's been over for 200 years. Why don't they just get over it? I was shocked. I couldn't believe it. And I thought to myself, do they really believe that? Do they really think that everything was just fine after slavery ended? And finally, I had to acknowledge that, yes, they did. They didn't know that there has been an unbroken line of various forms of discrimination to this very day. Freddie Gray's death shocked me into action, as I said. And since for most of my adult life, I've been a teacher in one way or another, I said to myself, people have to learn. They have to know what really happened because our lack of knowledge is hurting people, and ignorance never serves us well. We need to learn about these bitter realities of the past so that we can help to stop the pain and violence of the present. Though we clearly can't undo the past, we can look at where we are now. It seemed clear to me, as the philosopher James Martineau once said, we are each of us responsible for the evil we might have prevented. So a group of people in the community came together. There were eight of us. And we were black, of mixed race, Latina, indigenous, Hmong, and white, male and female. We joined together to do what we could to address these old and deeply rooted problems and bring them to the attention of our community. We called the program the Humanity Project, telling the untold story. And that's what we attempted to do. In short, we developed a series of programs to show videos about the history we never learned, and I brought in local speakers and had wide-ranging discussions about that history and its impact on our lives today. The meetings were very successful, and people frequently commented that they'd never before heard about the history we covered. And now a new group of very creative and dedicated people, including some from the original program, have reinvented the Humanity Project this time via Zoom, and the result has been outstanding. One thing we've learned in all of this is that the prime directive of racism has been segregation. Why is segregation essential to the kind of discrimination that oppresses people over generations? It's a simple principle, and it works like this. Say that there's a group of people who've lived together over time. For whatever reason, one part of that people become unhappy and decide to leave and move a long ways away. What will happen over time is that the new group will develop their own customs, language, determinations of what is right and wrong, cultural differences including food, music, the arts, etc. The differences may not be extreme, but they are significant, and there are many of them. You can look at our own country as an example. We broke away from England after a bitter war, and we can see many significant differences, including even language, although there are those who allege that we both speak English. Of course, black people have not physically moved away, but the same separation of cultures has been accomplished through segregation. Separation, segregation, is the fundamental engine of discrimination. That's why those who benefit from segregation know that it has to be maintained, because if we were allowed to interact with each other freely, to get to know each other as people, we'd find that people are people are people. 
uh, and we and that's why segregation has been maintained over the years, even after it is no longer legally allowed. As long as we could believe that black and white people were fundamentally different, we could justify treating black people differently. Now, the core issue here is this. None of this is about guilt for the past. It's about reaching out to find common ground. No group, none of us, is going anywhere. We're here for the duration. Therefore, we have to reach out and find a way to understand each other, to come together, having some disagreements, of course, because no one lives in perfect peace, but learning to deal with those disagreements reasonably. What can we do? We can educate ourselves about the history and current realities. We can form discussion groups at work or at home to learn that history and the present realities of black people. There are also many good movies and now many uh, videos that you can see that are excellent. I will close with this story that I once heard at a conference in Washington, D.C. This is the story. In a village very far away, there were some young boys playing. After a time, they became bored, as boys will, and their leader said, I have an idea. We'll go to the home of the oldest woman in the village, who everyone regards as the smartest person in the village, and I'll hold my hands behind my back and I'll say, old woman, old woman, the bird that I hold be, be in my hand behind my back, is it alive or is it dead? And if, and if, it is, if she says it's alive, I will simply crush it. If she says it's dead, I will release it and it will fly away. Either way, she'll be wrong. So feeling very proud of themselves, they march off to the village and come to the home of the old woman. She's working in her garden. And the young boy goes up to her and says, old woman, old woman, the bird that I hold in my hand behind my back, is it alive or is it dead? And she smiles at him and says, it's in your hand.